October 2nd, 1900, Volume 4, State of Victim for Italy and for Corato. Fearing that my state was no longer will of God, as blessed Jesus came, I said, How I fear that my state is no longer your will, because I see that I lack the two main things that kept me bound, suffering and your presence. And he, my daughter, it is not that I no longer want to keep you in this state, but since I want to chastise the world, this is why I am not coming and I make you lack suffering. And I, why remain in this state then? And he, your position of victim and your continuous waiting for me already break my arms. In fact, you do not see me, but I see you very well and I count all your sighs, your pains, your desires for me. And your being all intent on me is always an act of reparation for many who do not bother about me, nor desire me, but despise me and are all intent on earthly things, covered with mud, amid the stench of vices. So being the complete opposite of theirs, your state always comes to break justice, so much so that keeping you in this state and beginning the bloody wars in Italy is almost impossible for me. And I, how oh Lord, to remain in this state without suffering is almost impossible for me. I feel my strengths fail me because the strength to remain in this state comes to me from the sufferings. So since these are lacking, some day when you are not coming, I will try to go out. I am telling you this before, so you won't be displeased. And he, ah, yes, yes, you will go out of this state when I begin the slaughter in Italy. Then I will suspend it completely. While saying this, he showed the fiercest wars which are to happen, both among the secular and against the church. The blood inundated the towns like when there is a pouring rain. My poor heart writhed for the pain in seeing this, and remembering about my own town, I said, Ah, oh Lord, in saying that you will suspend me completely, you make me understand that not even for poor Corato will you have compassion. Not even Corato will you spare? And he, If sins reach a certain number, such that they will not deserve to have victim souls, and those who keep you as victim do not interest themselves, I will have no regard for her, that is, for Corato. Having said this, he disappeared, and I remained all oppressed and afflicted. October 2nd, 1901, Volume 4 Jesus takes her to heaven, and the angels ask him to show her to the peoples. She swims in God and tries to comprehend the interior of God. This morning my adorable Jesus came and transported me outside of myself in the midst of the peoples. Who can tell the evils, the horrors that could be seen? Then all afflicted he told me, My daughter, what a stench emanates from the earth. It was supposed to be one with heaven, and since in heaven they do nothing but love me, praise me, and thank me, the echo of heaven was to absorb the earth and form one only. But the earth has rendered itself unbearable. Therefore come and unite yourself with heaven, and in the name of all come to give me a satisfaction for them. In one instant I found myself amidst angels and saints. I am unable to say how, but I felt an infusion in me of what the angels and saints were singing and saying. And I, like them, did my part in the name of the whole earth. After this, all content, my sweet Jesus said, addressing everyone, Behold, an angelic note from the earth. How satisfied I feel. And while saying this, almost to repay me, 
He took me in his arms. He kissed me and kissed me over and over again, showing me to the whole celestial court as an object of his dearest satisfactions. On seeing this, the angel said, Lord, we pray you, show to the peoples what you have operated in this soul with a prodigious sign of your omnipotence, for your glory and for the good of souls. No longer keep the treasures poured in her hidden, so that as they themselves would see and touch your omnipotence in another creature, this might be cause of emendation for those who are evil and of greater spur for those who want to be good. On hearing this, I felt myself caught by a fear and annihilating myself completely to the point that I saw myself like a tiny little fish. I threw myself into the heart of Jesus, saying, Lord, I want nothing but you and to be hidden in you. This is what I have always asked of you, and this is what I pray you to confirm in me. Having said this, I enclosed myself in the interior of Jesus, as though swimming in the most extensive seas of the interior of God. Then Jesus said to all, Have you heard that? She wants nothing but me, and to be hidden in me. This is her greatest contentment. And I, on seeing an intention so pure, feel more drawn to her. And seeing her displeasure, if I were to show my work to the peoples with a prodigious sign, so as not to sadden her, will not concede what you have asked me for. It seemed that the angels were insisting, but I did not pay attention to anyone any more. I did nothing but swim in God to comprehend the divine interior. But no, I seem to be like a little child who wants to clasp in his little hand an object of immeasurable magnitude, such that as he grabs it, it escapes from him, and he can barely manage to touch it. So he is unable to tell either how much it weighs or how large that object is. Or like another child who, not knowing all the depth of the studies, says with yearning, that he must learn everything in a short time. But he can barely manage to learn the first letters of the alphabet. In the same way, the creature can say nothing but this. I have touched it. It is beautiful. It is great. There is no good it does not possess. But how beautiful is it? How much greatness does it contain? How many goods does it possess? This I am unable to tell. That is, of God, she can tell the first letters of the alphabet, leaving the whole depth of studies behind. So even in heaven, my dearest brothers, angels, and saints, being creatures, do not have the capacity of comprehending their creator in everything. They are like many containers filled with God, which, if one wants to fill them more, overflow outside. I believe I am speaking much nonsense. Therefore, I stop here. October 2nd, 1903, Volume 5. One who is united with Jesus grows in his very life, gives development to the graft he made in redemption, and adds more branches to the tree of his humanity. The Interior and the Exterior Souls As I was in my usual state, all embittered and afflicted, and almost dazed because of the privation of my adorable Jesus, not knowing myself where I was, whether in hell or on earth, I just barely saw him like a flash that escapes saying, One who is on the path of virtues is in my very life, and one who is on the path of vice is in contradiction with me. And he disappeared. A little later, in another flash, he added, 
My incarnation grafted humanity to the divinity, and if one tries to remain united with me with his will, with his works, and with his heart, trying to carry out his life according to the standard of mine, it can be said that he grows in my very life and gives development to the graft made by me, adding more branches to the tree of my humanity. If, on the other hand, he does not unite with me, in addition to not growing in me, he gives no development to the graft, but rather, since one who is not with me cannot have life, with perdition the graft is undone. And he disappeared again. After this I found myself outside of myself, inside a garden in which there were several rose bushes, some nicely bloomed, in the right proportion, almost half closed, and others with petals falling off, to the point that a slight movement was enough to prune them, leaving just the stem of the rose naked. A young man, I do not know who he was, said to me, The first roses are the interior souls who operate in their interior. These souls are symbolized by the rose petals which are turned inwards, adding a distinction of beauty, of freshness, and of solidity, with no fear that some petals may fall to the ground. The external petals symbolize the blooming that the interior soul does outwards. Receiving life from within her, her works are fragrant with holy charity, and almost like lights, they strike the eyes of God and of her neighbor. The second rose bushes are the exterior souls. The little good that they do is all external and in the sight of everyone. Since there is no interior blooming, there cannot be the aim for God alone and his love alone. And because this is lacking, the petals, that is the virtues, cannot be well attached. So, as the light breath of pride comes, it makes the petals fall off. As the breaths of complacency, of love of self, of esteem of others, of contradictions, of mortification come, they just barely touch the rose and the petals fall to the ground. So poor rose, it remains always naked, without petals, with only thorns left, which prick its conscience. After this I found myself inside myself. October 2nd, 1906, Volume 7 how our sufferings can relieve Jesus. Having received communion, I felt I was outside of myself, and I saw a person who was very oppressed by various crosses. And blessed Jesus was saying, Tell her that in the act in which she feels as though dogged by persecutions, by punctures, by sufferings, she should think that I am present with her and that whatever she suffers, she can use to heal and medicate my wounds. So her sufferings will serve to medicate now my side, now my head, now my hands and feet, which are too much in pain and embittered by the grave offenses that creatures give me. This is a great honor that I give her by giving her myself the medicine to medicate my wounds and by also giving her the merit of charity for having medicated me. While he was saying this, I saw many purging souls who on hearing this all amazed said, Fortunate are all of you to receive so many sublime teachings that you acquire the merits to medicate a God which surpass all other merits and merit, and your glory will be distinct from the others, as is heaven from the earth. Oh, if only we had received these teachings, that our sufferings could serve to medicate a God, how many riches we would acquire, which now we do not have. 
October 2nd, 1913, Volume 11. When the human will unites to the divine will, the life of Jesus is formed within the soul. Taking the divine will means taking everything. Continuing in my usual state, blessed Jesus made himself seen inside of me, but so much identified with me that I could see his eyes within mine, his mouth within mine, and so on with the rest. While I saw him like this, he said to me, My daughter, look at how I identify myself with the soul who does my will, making myself one with her. I become her own life because my will is inside and outside of that soul. One can say that my will is like the air she breathes, which gives life to everything in her, like the light which makes everything seen and understood, like the heat which warms, fecundates, and makes one grow, like the heart that palpitates, like the hands that work, like the feet that walk, when the human will unites itself to my volition, my life is formed in the soul. Then, having received communion, I was saying to Jesus, I love you. And he told me, My daughter, do you really want to love me? Say, Jesus, I love you with your will. And since my will fills heaven and earth, your love will surround me everywhere, and your I love you will resound up there in the heavens and down to the bottom of the abysses. So if you want to say, I adore you, I bless you, I praise you, I thank you, you will say it united with my will, and you will fill heaven and earth with adorations, benedictions, praises, thanksgiving, in my will. These are simple, easy, and immense things. My will is everything, to the extent that my very attributes, what are they? A simple act of my will. Therefore, if justice, goodness, wisdom, fortitude follow their course, my will precedes them, accompanies them, and places them in the act of operating. In sum, they do not move one point from my volition. Therefore, whoever takes my will takes everything. Even more, she can say that her life is ended. Ended the weaknesses, the temptations, the passions, and the miseries. Because all things lose their rights in the one who does my will. My will has primacy over everything and right to all. October 2nd, 1915, Volume 11, Sins Attract Chastisements. After having suffered very much because of the privations of my always adorable Jesus, it seemed that he came for a little while, but in such suffering as to be terrifying. I plucked up courage and drew near to the mouth of Jesus. I kissed him, and I tried to suckle. Who knows if I manage to relieve him by suckling part of his bitterness. To my surprise, I was able to draw some bitterness out of him, which other times I did not manage to do. But Jesus was in such suffering that it seemed as if he didn't realize it. However, after I did this, as if he were stirring himself, he looked at me and said, my daughter, I cannot take any more. I cannot take any more. The creature has reached the brim. She fills me with such bitterness that my justice was in the act of decreeing the general destruction. But you arrived in time to snatch a little bit of bitterness away from me so that my justice might still hold off. However, the chastisements will spread more. A man incites me. 
He disposes me to fill him, almost stuff him with sorrows and chastisements. Otherwise he will not change his mind. I hastened to pray him that he would calm down, and with a moving tone he told me, Ah, my daughter, ah, my daughter. And he disappeared. October 2nd, 1916, Volume 11, Effects of Communion in the Divine Will. This morning I received communion in the way Jesus had taught me, that is, united with his humanity, his divinity, and his will. And Jesus on coming made himself seen, and I kissed him and clasped him to my heart. He returned my kiss and my embrace and told me, My daughter, how content I am that you have come to receive me united with my humanity, divinity, and will. You have renewed in me all the contentment I received when I communicated myself. And while you were kissing me and embracing me, since all of myself was in you, you contained all creatures, and I felt I was given the kiss of all, the embraces of all, because this was your will, as was mine in communicating myself, to return to the Father all the love of creatures, even though many would not love him. The Father made up for their love in me, and I make up for the love of all creatures in you. And having found in my will one who loves me, repairs me, in the name of all, because in my will there is nothing that the creature cannot give me. I feel like loving creatures even if they offend me, and I keep inventing stratagems of love around the hardest hearts in order to convert them. Only for love of these souls who do everything in my will do I feel as though chained, captured, and I concede to them the prodigies of the greatest conversions. October 2nd, 1924, Volume 17 Effects of the Adoration of the Power of the Father, of the Wisdom of the Son, of the love of the Holy Spirit, done with the divine will. I felt all embittered because of the privation of my sweet Jesus. Oh, how much harder and more bitter my exile becomes without the one who forms my life. And I prayed him to have compassion for me and not to leave me at the mercy of myself. Now while I was saying this, my beloved Jesus made himself seen as he was squeezing my heart tightly with his hands and then binding me all with a little rope of light, but so tightly as to prevent me from making the slightest movement. Then he laid himself within me and we suffered together. In the meantime, I felt I was being transported outside of myself toward the vault of the heavens and I seemed to meet the Celestial Father and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, who was with me, placed himself between them and placed me on the lap of the Father, who seemed to be waiting for me with so much love that he pressed me to his womb and, identifying me with his will, communicated his power to me. So did the other two divine persons, with wisdom and with love, but while they communicated themselves to me, one by one then, they all became one, and I felt I was being infused with, altogether, the will of the power of the Father, the will of the wisdom of the Son, and the will of the love of the Holy Spirit. But who can say all that I felt as being infused in my soul? And my adorable Jesus said to me, Daughter of our eternal will, prostrate yourself before our supreme majesty and offer your adorations, your homages, your praises in the name of all, 
with the power of our will, with the wisdom and with the will of our supreme love. In this way we will feel in you the power of our will adoring us, the wisdom of our will glorifying us, the love of our will loving us and praising us. And since the power, the wisdom, and the love of the three divine persons are in communication with the intellect, the memory, and the will of all creatures, we will feel your adorations, homages, and praises flow within all the intelligences of creatures, which, rising between heaven and earth, will make us hear the echo of our own power, wisdom, and love, adoring us, praising us, and loving us. Greater adorations, more noble homages, love and praises more divine, she cannot give us. No other act can equal these acts, or give us as much glory and as much love, because we see the power, the wisdom, and the reciprocal love of the three divine persons flow within the act of the creature. We find our own acts in the act of the creature. How not to enjoy them and not to give them supremacy over all other acts. So I prostrated myself before the Supreme Majesty, adoring it, praising it, and loving it in the name of all, with the power of their will, wisdom, and love, which I felt within me. But who can say the effects of this? I have no words to express them, so I move forward. Then afterwards I received Holy Communion, and I was fusing myself in the will of my highest good Jesus in order to find in it all of creation so that no one might miss the roll call and together with me all may prostrate themselves at the feet of my Jesus in the sacrament to adore him, to love him, to bless him, and so forth. But while I was doing this, I felt somehow distracted in trying to find all the created things in his divine will, so that one and with all might be the love, the praises, the adorations to my Jesus. And Jesus, in seeing me as though entangled, gathered all of creation onto his lap and said to me, My daughter, I placed all of creation on my lap, that it may be easier for you to find and call everyone together with you so that not one thing which came from me may not give me through you the return of love and adoration which befits me as things which belong to me. I would not be fully content in you if any of them were missing. In my will I want to find everything in you. Then it became easier for me to find and call all of creation together with me so that all might praise and love my highest good Jesus. But, oh, marvel, each created thing contained a distinct reflection and a special love of Jesus. And Jesus received the return of his reflections and of his own love. Oh, how content was Jesus. But as I was doing this, I found myself inside myself. October 2nd, 1926 Volume 20, How the Generations Are Linked to One Another, and Therefore There Are Some That Pray, Some That Receive, and Some That Possess. How Jesus Gives According to Our Dispositions. His Word is a New Creation. How in Heaven There Are No Secrets. I was feeling embittered to the summit because of the privation of my sweet Jesus. Oh, how bad I felt. I could not take any more. But when I reached as though the extremes of pain, he moved in my interior, and all afflicted told me, My daughter, I am looking at how much I have to expand the boundaries of the kingdom of my will 
to give possession of it to creatures. I know that they are unable to grasp the endlessness that the kingdom of my will contains, because it is not given to them as creatures to cross and embrace a will that corresponds to a kingdom that has no boundaries. In fact, since they are created beings, they are always restricted and limited. But even though they are limited, I dispose more or less goods and the extension of the expanses that they must possess according to their dispositions. And so I am looking at posterity, at the dispositions that they will have, and I am looking at those in the present to see the dispositions that they have, because those in the present must pray, impetrate, and prepare the kingdom of the supreme fiat for posterity and according to the dispositions of posterity and to the interest of those present so do I keep expanding the boundaries of my kingdom because the generations are so linked to one another that it always happens this way one prays another prepares another impetrates another possesses the same happened with my coming upon earth in order to form the redemption it was not those who were present that prayed sighed and cried to obtain its goods they are the ones who enjoy them and possess them but those who lived before my coming and according to the dispositions of those in the present and the prayers and dispositions of those in the past so did I expand the boundaries of the goods of redemption in fact only when a good can be useful for creatures, then do I give it. But if it brings them no utility, why give it? And this utility is taken by them if they have more dispositions. But do you know when I expand its boundaries? When I manifest to you a new knowledge that regards the kingdom of my will. This is why before manifesting it to you, I cast a glance over all to see their dispositions, whether it will be useful for them, or it will be for them as if it had not been spoken. And in seeing that I want to expand my boundaries more in order to give them more goods, more joys, more happiness to possess, but they are not disposed, I feel afflicted and I wait for your prayers, for your rounds in my will, for your pains, in order to dispose those present, as well as posterity. And then I return to the new surprises of my manifestations about my will. This is why I am afflicted when I do not speak to you. My word is the greatest gift. It is a new creation and being unable to issue it from myself because creatures are not disposed to receive it. I feel within me the weight of the gift I want to give and unable to give it. I remain afflicted and taciturn and my affliction grows even more in seeing you afflicted because of me. If you knew how I feel your sadness, how it all pours into my heart, my will brings it deep into my inmost heart because I do not have two wills but one and since it reigns in you as a consequence it brings your afflictions deep inside of me therefore pray and let your flight be continuous in the supreme fiat that you may impetrate that creatures would dispose themselves and I may return to speak once again Having said this, he kept silent, and I remained more afflicted than before. I felt all the weight that Jesus felt because of the lack of dispositions of creatures. I felt as if Jesus would no longer speak to me for now. But Jesus, wanting to cheer me from my affliction, and also cheer himself, told me, My daughter, Courage, 
Do you think that everything that passed between me and you will be known? No, my daughter. I will make known what is necessary, what regards the kingdom of the supreme fiat. Or rather, I will be even more generous compared to what creatures will take of this kingdom of mine, to give them free field in order to advance more and more, so as to let them expand their possession in the supreme fiat, that they may never say, Enough, we have no place else to reach. No, no, I will use such abundance that man will always have something to take and to extend his journey. But in spite of such abundance, not everyone will know our secrets, just as not everyone knows what passed between me and my mamma in order to form the kingdom of redemption. The surprising graces, the innumerable favors, they will know them in heaven where there are no secrets. While on earth they have known only what I gave in superabundance for their good. So I will do with you. If I looked, it was for those who want to come to live in the kingdom of my will. But for you, for the little daughter of my will, for the one who has formed this kingdom together with me with so much sacrifice, will my love ever be able to say enough? or deny my word to you, or not pour in you the continuous flow of my graces? No, I cannot, my little daughter. This is not in the nature of my heart nor of my will, that contains a continuous act, never interrupted, of giving, and giving always new surprises to one who knows no other life but the life of my will. If you see me taciturn, it is not because of you, because between me and you there is no need of words in order to understand each other. To see each other is to understand each other. I pour all of myself in you, and you in me, and in pouring myself, I pour new graces in you, and you take them, because what is necessary for you who must be the primary cause in order to form the kingdom of the eternal fiat, will not be necessary for those who only have to live in it. With you, it is not only about living in it, but about forming it. Therefore your Jesus must abound very much with you, to give you the raw materials for the formation of a kingdom so holy. This happens also in the low world, one who must form a kingdom has need of many means, of many raw materials, while one who must form only one city needs much less, and one who only moves to live in it, with very few means can live in this city. The sacrifices that one who has to form a kingdom must make are not necessary for those who come to the decision of wanting to live in that kingdom. Therefore, I just want you to work in the formation of the kingdom of the supreme fiat, and your Jesus will take care of all the rest. October 2nd, 1927, Volume 23, How Adam Was the Holiest One Before He Sinned fullness and totality of goods of the acts done in the divine will, how they extend to all. The pupil of the eye invested by the sun. The creature in the divine will lends herself as matter and hides her creator. Example of the host. I was doing my round in the creation to follow all the acts of the divine will that are in it. And as I arrived at Eden, in which God created the first man, Adam, in order to unite myself with him to that unity of wills that he possessed with God, in which he did his first acts in the period of creation, I thought to myself, who knows what sanctity my first father Adam possessed? What value his first acts done in the kingdom of the divine fiat contained? And how can I impetrate a kingdom so holy upon earth again, 
as I am the only one occupied with obtaining a good so great. But while I was thinking of this, my always lovable Jesus came out from within my interior, sending rays of light, and that light converted into words, and he told me, My daughter, firstborn daughter of my will, I want to reveal to you as daughter of my will the sanctity of he who possessed the kingdom of my divine fiat. At the beginning of creation, this kingdom had its life, its perfect dominion, and its complete triumph. So it is not completely foreign to the human family, and because it is not foreign, there is all the sure hope for it to return again into their midst to reign and dominate. Now you must know that Adam possessed such sanctity when he was created by God, and his acts, even the slightest, had such value that no saint, either before or after my coming upon earth, can be compared to his sanctity. And all of their acts together do not reach the value of one single act of Adam, because in my divine will he possessed the fullness of sanctity, the totality of all the divine goods. And do you know what fullness means? It means to be filled to the brim, to the point of overflowing with light, sanctity, love, with all the divine qualities, in such a way as to be able to fill heaven and earth, over which he had dominion, and through which his kingdom extended. Therefore, each one of his acts done in this fullness of divine goods had such value that no one else, as much as he might sacrifice himself, suffer, and do good, but does not possess the kingdom of my will and its total dominion, can be compared to one alone of these acts in the kingdom of my will. Therefore, the glory, the love that Adam gave me, as long as he lived in the kingdom of my divine volition, no one, no one has given me, because in his acts he gave me fullness and totality of all goods, and only in my will can these acts be found. Outside of it, they do not exist. Therefore, Adam had his riches, his acts of infinite value, that my eternal will communicated to him before the divinity, because in creating him, God had left nothing empty within him, but everything was divine fullness, as much as a creature could contain. And when he fell into sin, these acts, these riches of his, this glory and perfect love that he had given to his creator, were not destroyed. On the contrary, it is by virtue of them and of his operating done in my divine fiat that he earned the redemption. No one who had possessed the kingdom of my will, even for a short time, could not remain without redemption. One who possesses this kingdom enters into such bonds and rights with God that God himself feels with him the strength of his own chains that bind him, and he cannot get rid of him. Our adorable majesty with Adam was in the same condition as a father who has a son who has been for him the cause of many conquests, of great riches, of incalculable glory. There is nothing the father possesses in which he does not find the acts of his son. He feels the glory and the love of his son resound everywhere. Now to his misfortune, this son falls into poverty. Can the father ever not have compassion for his son, as he feels everywhere and in every place the love, the glory, the riches with which his son has surrounded him? My daughter, by living in the kingdom of our will, Adam had penetrated into our boundaries that are interminable, and he had placed his acts, his glory, 
his love for his creator everywhere. And as our child, with the act he emitted, he brought us our riches, our joys, our glory and love. His echo resounded in our whole being as ours did in his. Now in seeing him fallen into poverty, how could our love bear not having compassion on him if our divine will itself lovingly waged war on us and pleaded for he who had lived in it? Do you see then what living in my divine will means, its great importance, in it there is fullness of all divine goods and totality of all possible and imaginable acts. The soul embraces the whole of the divine being. She is in my will like the eye before the sun that remains all filled with its light. And while the whole sun is reflected in the pupil of the eye, its light remains also outside of it investing the whole person and covering the earth without departing from within the pupil. And while its light remains in the eye, it would want to bring the pupil into the sun, to let it go round the earth with itself, to let it do what the light does and receive its acts everywhere as attestation of love and glory. This is an image of the soul who lives in my will. My will fills her with such fullness as to leave no empty space within her. And since she is incapable of possessing the whole divine immensity, it fills her for as much as the creature can contain. And without separating from her, it remains outside of her, bringing the pupil of the will of the soul into the endlessness of its light to let her do what my divine will does and receive the requital of her acts and of her love. O oh, power of my divine fiat operating in the creature who letting herself be invested by its light does not refuse its dominion and its kingdom. And if Adam deserved compassion it was because the first period of his life was in the kingdom of the divine will. If the celestial sovereign lady, though she was alone, was able to obtain the coming of the word upon earth, it was because she gave free field to the kingdom of the divine fiat within herself. If my very humanity was able to form the kingdom of redemption, it was only because it possessed the whole entireness and immensity of the kingdom of the eternal volition, because wherever it extends, it embraces everything, it can do anything, and there is no power against it that can constrain it. So one alone who possesses the kingdom of my will is worth more than everything and everyone and can earn and impetrate what all others together can neither earn nor obtain, because all others, together, however good, but without the life of my will in them, are always the little flames, the little plants, the little flowers that at the most serve to adorn the earth. They are subject to being extinguished and to wither, and the divine goodness can neither place great entrustments upon them nor concede such portents as to do good to the entire world. On the other hand, one who lives in my will is more than sun, and just as the sun invests everyone with the empire of its light, it rules over the plants and gives life, color, fragrance, sweetness to each one of them. It imposes itself on everything with its tacit empire, to give its effects and the goods it possesses, and no other sphere does so much good to the earth as the sun does. In the same way, those in whom my will lives are more than sun, and with the light that they contain, they lower themselves and then rise with rapidity. They penetrate everywhere, into God, 
into his acts. With the divine will that they possess, they rule over God himself and over creatures. They are capable of overwhelming everything to hold out the life of the light they possess to all. They are the bearers of their creator, and they let the light walk ahead of them to impetrate and obtain and give whatever they want. Oh, if creatures knew such a great good, they would compete among themselves, and all passions would change into passion of light for living only and always in that divine fiat that sanctifies everything, gives everything, and rules everything. My poor mind continued to wander in the divine volition, and it marveled at the sublimeness, fullness, and totality of the acts done in it. And my beloved Jesus moving in my interior added, My daughter, let your marvel cease. The living in my divine fiat is to operate in it. It is the transfusion of the creator into the creature, and there is an infinite distance between the divine operating and the operating of the creature alone. She lends herself to her God as matter, to let him operate great things, just as the matter of light lent itself to the divine fiat in creation, to let it form the sun, the heavens, the stars, the sea, all matters in which the supreme fiat resounded, and it manufactured the whole creation. A prodigy of it is the sun, the heavens, the sea, the earth, that were vivified and animated by the fiat, perennial and enchanting display of what my will knows how to do and can do. It happens with the soul, as with the accidents of the host, that though being matter lends itself to let itself be animated by my sacramental life, as long as those same words spoken by me in instituting the most holy sacrament are pronounced by the priest. Those were words animated by my fiat that contained the creative power. And this is why the matter of the host undergoes the transubstantiation of the divine life. One can pronounce as many words as one wants over the host, but if they are not those few words established by the fiat, my life remains in heaven and the host remains the wretched matter that it is. So it happens with the soul. She can do, say, suffer what she wants, but if my divine fiat does not run inside of them, those are always finite and wretched things. On the other hand, for one who lives in it, her words, her works, her pains, are like veils that hide the Creator, and he who created heaven and earth makes use of these veils, and makes of them works worthy of himself, placing in them his sanctity, his creative power, his infinite love. Therefore no one else, though he might do great things, can compare to that creature in whom my divine will lives reigns and dominates. Among creatures also it happens that, according to the material they have in their hands with which to form their works, so does the value that they possess and acquire vary. Suppose that someone has properties of iron. How much he has to work, sweat, and toil to render that iron soft, to give it the shape of the container he wants to make and the earning he makes is so small that he can barely make a living. On the other hand, someone else has properties of gold, of precious stones. This one works, oh, how much less, but he earns millions. So it is not the work that brings great earning, exuberant riches, but the value of the material that one possesses. Someone works little and earns much, 
because the material he possesses contains great value. Someone else works much, but because the material he possesses is wretched and of very little value, is always the poor ragged one, and his stomach half empty. So it happens to one who possesses my divine will. He possesses the life, the creative virtue, and his littlest acts contain a divine and immeasurable value. Therefore no one can equal his riches. On the other hand, one who does not possess my will as his own life is without life, and he works with the material of his own will, and therefore he is always the poor ragged one before God, and he is empty of that food that forms in him the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven. October 2nd, 1929, Volume 27. Only the divine will renders the creature happy, one prey to the other. One who does not have the true will to do a good is a poor cripple, and God does not want to make use of him. My abandonment and living in the divine fiat continues. Oh, how powerful is its creative strength. Oh, how dazzling is its light that penetrating into the inmost fibers of the heart invests them and caressing them, it makes space for itself and raises its throne of dominion and of command, but with such enrapturing sweetness that the littleness of the creature remains vanished but happy to remain without life and dissolved in the divine fiat. Oh, if all knew you, how adorable will, oh, how they would love to become lost in you in order to reacquire your life and be happy of the very divine happiness. But while my littleness was dissolving in the divine fiat, my lovable Jesus moved in my interior and clasping me very tightly to his divine heart, told me, My daughter, only my divine will can render the creature happy. With its light, it either eclipses or puts to flight all evils, and says with its divine power, I am perennial happiness. Flee, you, all evils. I want to be free, because before my happiness, all evils lose life. With one who lives completely in my divine volition, its love is so great as to transform the actions of the creature, and an exchange of life takes place between God and her, an exchange of actions, of steps, of heartbeats. God remains clasped to the creature, and the creature to God. They become inseparable beings. And in this exchange of action and of life, the game is formed between creator and creature. One makes oneself prey to the other. And in this becoming prey to each other, they play in a divine manner. They make each other happy. They make feasts. And God and the creatures sing glory. They feel victorious because no one has lost but one has conquered the other. In fact, in my divine will, no one loses. Losses do not exist in it. Only of one who lives in my will can I say that she is my amusement in creation, and I feel victorious in lowering myself to let myself be conquered by the creature, because I know for sure that she will not be opposed to letting herself be conquered by me. Therefore let the flight in my will be always continuous. After this I was thinking about many things that blessed Jesus had told me about his divine will, his many ardent yearnings to make it known, and how in spite of the many yearnings of Jesus, nothing would arise to obtain his intent. And I said to myself, What wisdom of God! 
What profound mysteries! Who can ever comprehend them? He wants it. He is sorrowful because there is no one who opens the way for his will to make it known. He shows his heart yearning, longing for his divine will to make its way so as to make itself known, to form its kingdom in the midst of creatures. And then, as if he were an impotent god, the ways are barred, the doors are closed, and Jesus tolerates, and with invincible and unspeakable patience, he waits for doors and ways to open, and he knocks at the hearts in order to find those who will be the ones who will occupy themselves with making his divine will known. But while I was thinking about this, my sweet Jesus, making himself seen, all goodness and tenderness, such as to break the hardest hearts, told me, My daughter, if you knew how much I suffer when I want to form my works and make them known to creatures in order to give them the good they contain, and I find no one who has true enthusiasm, genuine desire, and the will to make my work his life in order to make it known, so as to give to others the life of the good of my work that he feels within himself. And when I see these dispositions in one who must occupy himself with it, whom I call and choose with so much love for the works that belong to me, I feel so drawn to him that in order that he may do well what I want, I lower myself, I descend into him, and I give him my mind, my mouth, my hands, and even my feet, that he may feel the life of my work in everything, and as life that is felt, not as something extraneous to him, he may feel the need to give it to others. My daughter, when a good is not felt within oneself as life, everything ends up in words, not in works, and I remain outside of them, not inside, and therefore they remain like poor cripples, without intelligence, blind, mute, without hands and without feet. And I, in my works, do not want to make use of poor cripples. I put them aside and, heedless of time, I continue to go around in order to find those who are disposed, who must serve my work. And just as I did not get tired of going around the centuries and the entire earth in order to find the littlest one, so as to place in her littleness the great deposit of the knowledges about my divine will. So will I not get tired of going around the earth over and over again to find the true disposed ones who will appreciate as life what I have manifested about the divine fiat, and these will make any sacrifice in order to make it known. Therefore I am not the impotent God, but rather that patient God who wants that my works be done with decorum and by people who are willing, not forced, because the thing I abhor the most in my works is the unwillingness of the creature, as if I did not deserve their little sacrifices. And for the decorum of a work so great, that is, that of making my divine will known. I do not want to use poor cripples. In fact, when one does not have the genuine will to do a good, it is always a mutilation that he does to his soul. But I want to use people who, as I provide them with my divine members, would do it with decorum as a work that must bring so much good to creatures and great glory to my majesty deserves.
October 2nd, 1938, Volume 36, How the Kingdom of the Divine Will is a Decree that Must Come on Earth, How it Has to Sweep the Earth. The Queen of Heaven Prays and Cries. The Divine Will is like the lymph for the plants. I am always in the Divine Will although in inexpressible bitternesses, as if they wanted to muddy its sea. But this sea of the fiat forms its waves, and covering and hiding me inside of itself, sweetens my bitterness, gives me back strength, and makes me continue my way in its will. Its power is such as to reduce to nothing my bitterness, making rise again from within itself its life full of sweetness, how beautiful and majestic. And I adore it. I thank it. I pray it never to leave me alone and abandoned. Then my sweet Jesus, repeating his little visit, told me, My good daughter, courage, if you lose heart, you will lose the strength to live always in my will. Do not worry about what they say and do. Our victory is in the fact that they cannot prevent us from doing what we want to do. So I can talk to you about my divine will, and you can listen. No power can obstruct this. All that I tell you about my will is nothing other than the accomplishment of our decree established since eternity in the council of our most holy trinity our will must have its kingdom on earth our decrees are infallible nothing can prevent them from being fulfilled just as creation and redemption were our decrees so our decree is the kingdom of our will on earth therefore in order to fulfill this decree I have to manifest the goods contained in it, its qualities, its beauties, and marvels. Here is the necessity I had to talk to you so much, to accomplish this decree. Daughter, I wanted to do this, by winning man through my love. But human perfidy does not allow me. Therefore, I will use justice. I will sweep the earth. I will take away all the harmful creatures who, like poisoned plants, poison the innocent plants. Once I have purified everything, my truths will find the way to give to the survivors the life, the balm, and the peace that they contain. And everybody will receive them giving them the kiss of peace to the confusion of those who did not believe in them and even condemned them. My truths will reign and I will have my kingdom on earth. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, once again, let us not move in anything. Let us do our way and we will sing victory they can do their way, in which they will find confusion and shame of themselves. It will happen to them as to the blind, who do not believe in the light of the sun, because they do not see it. They will remain in their blindness, while those who see it will enjoy and show off the goods of the light with complete happiness. Jesus remained silent. My poor mind was troubled by the so many evils that invest and will invest the earth. In the meantime, the sovereign queen made herself seen with her eyes all red, as if bleeding for so much crying. What a heartbreak in seeing my heavenly mother crying. Then, with her maternal tone, with inexpressible tenderness, crying, she told me, Dearest daughter of mine, 
pray together with me. It breaks my heart to see the chastisements that will invest the whole humanity. The volubility of the leaders. Today they say something, tomorrow something else. Will throw the peoples in a sea of pains, and of blood too. Poor children of mine. Pray, my daughter, do not leave me alone in my suffering. May all happen for the triumph of the divine will. Then I was following the divine will in its acts, all abandoned in its arms, when my sweet Jesus continued, My daughter, as the creature enters our will to make it her own, it makes our will her own, and we will make her will our own. In everything she does, loving, adoring, working, suffering, and praying, our will forms its divine seed in her acts. Oh, how beautiful, fresh, and saintly she grows. Our will is like the lymph for the plants. If there is lymph in the plants, they grow beautifully, green, thick of leaf, producing mature, big, tasty fruits. But if the lymph begins to be missing, the poor plant loses the green. The leaves fall. She can't produce her nice fruits, so in the end it dries up. The lymph is like the soul of the plant like the vital humors that sustain the plant and make it bloom. Such is the soul without my will. It loses the principle, the life, the soul of the good. It loses the vegetation, the freshness, the strength. It becomes faded, moronic, weak, and ends up losing the seed of good. If you knew how much I pity a soul who lives without my will, I could call her the painful scene of the creation. I, who created all things with such beauty and harmony, am forced, because of human ingratitude, to see the most beautiful creatures I made, poor, weak, covered with wounds, to move to pity. And still, my will is at everyone's disposal. It is not denied to anybody. Only those who reject it, who ungrateful, do not want to know it, voluntarily deprive themselves of it. Great pain for us. End of October 2nd. Fiat 